Shavuot Tov, a good week. I'm Avram Shira here in Eretz Israel. You know, it's been a, it's been a noisy, rumbly, bumbly Shabbat with bombs here and there and jets flying over. And, you know, it's, it's kind of strange to get used to a war, you know, as a civilian, and you hear it happening. But it's people's lives, you know. It's really something you don't want to get used to because your heart gets thick. And you don't feel the feelings that are appropriate. But this week I found a piece of Zohar that we really need to learn. And it's really a follow-up from Friday's class called the Backdoor Redemption. And this is going to explain more of the Kabbalah about redemption, what it is, why it is, why God does what he does at all. And why the Jews stand by God no matter what. So it starts off, across Shem Elohim El Adam. Go back to the beginning of the Torah. The very beginning. God is talking to Adam. And he says to him, Where are you, Adam? You were close to me. We were like one. I was speaking inside you. And now... Where are you? As if God doesn't know. No, when God asks you where you are, he's telling you you're far. But he's saying it in a nice way. Where are you? Where have you been? We missed you. Adam, what happened? Did something happen in the garden? The word ayeka can be spelled and with vowels ekha. Lamentations. And that's where the Zohar is taking us. It's an allusion to the future destruction of the temple. A calamitous event, if you will, in Jewish history. And from the crying out comes the Echa, which now you see connects Adam's cry, God's cry to Adam, excuse me, to the cry of the prophet Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, who cried out, Echa. As it is written, Echa yashva badad, how she is dwelling alone. Jerusalem. A destroyed city at the hands of Babylon. How she, like a widow, the whole book compares her, dwelling alone. And the letters, of course, as we said, spell out the same word. It's a very positive thing now. Zohar jumps to another idea that in the future, Hashem is going to burn away all the negative forces. Whether they're human or subhuman or pre-human, if they're negative, they're going to get burnt, fried, finished. including the angel of death himself. And this is where we take our promise for life in the world to come. That God will one day swallow the death that Adam brought into the world. God's going to burn it out. Swallow it up, finished. And then everything, Shav, will return to its place in the pristine perfection of God's creation in the beginning, before man came along and started to mess with the control box. As it's written, On that day, God and his name, his reputation, his place in the upper worlds will be equivocated, replay, reproduced in this world. So you won't have to ask, where is God? You won't ever ask that. And you will never ask what he wants from you because you'll know because your spark of God will be shining out of you. That's the world to come, folks. Just we'll be in our bodies. So our bodies will be transformed into light beings as well. Various degrees. It's not going to be a Hollywood movie. It's going to be much greater. Now, Breshit. So in the beginning, The, the, the Zohar is going to bring us a, a commentary on King Solomon, where in the Song of Songs, wherever it says Shlomo, 
the king, it's talking about God. Right, because Shlomo spoke with Ruach HaKodesh, the divine inspiration invested him to give over that song, Shira Shiri. And this is it's talking about the feminine aspect of God. Because there's a part of God that gives, and there's a part of God that receives, just like every human being. Isn't that interesting? Now, And so, too, in the future, the feminine and the masculine will be one, as they were in the beginning. And that's part of this redemption process. When the male and female were one in heaven, they split off, and then they come down into the world, and then they must find themselves and reunite in sacred matrimony, if you can borrow a phrase. And that matrimony is the reunion of the male and the female. And that happens on a cosmic and individual level. Now, and it ends this verse with in wisdom, a person should build a house. Now, we're not talking about a, just a physical house, we're talking about a spiritual house, a home, a true home with a man and a woman building a healthy, whole family. Now, okay. And it goes on to tell Zora that in the beginning, God hid his name in creation, and then he brought it out. And then we look at this week's Parsha, and God hid his name in Yosef. When God brought Yosef out of the prison, he unified his name with Yosef, and Yosef became instantly, overnight, the second man of Egypt, right behind the Pharaoh. But what did he go down there for? Well, as Arizal, great Kabbalist, explains to us that he went down there to gather the sparks of holiness. Well, we know the Peshat, the simple version, is that he went there to prepare the land for his father Jacob and his 11 brothers and sisters and cousins and everybody else that wanted to come. There were a lot of souls. And he brought them down to Egypt. But the Kabbalistic version is they didn't go just to save themselves from the, you know, the famine in Canaan. They went down there because there were sparks of holiness there that needed to be redeemed. Now, what is this process of redeeming sparks of holiness? Because you hear it everywhere in Kabbalistic literature. And if you understand it, you'll understand the entire creation. But basically, in the beginning, it was all God. And then God created everything from his light. And those lights had sparks of, of him in, invested in everything. And that all orders of creation, the animal, the human, the plant, the mineral, on all levels of creation, the spiritual and the physical, and the positive and the negative and the double negative, if you will. There's sparks everywhere. And they have one united common force. They want to return to their source. Imagine, you know, the, the old classic metaphor they give is the blacksmith swinging the hammer on the steel, right? Psh, big giant ball of sparks flies away. Well, all those sparks are flying, not just the width of the blacksmith shop. This is a very big shop here. We're talking hundreds of millions of light years. The sparks of God are flying and yet it all it wants to return, all those sparks. And how do they return? An amazing thing happens. How do they return? Some giant uh, machine, some invention? No. By man, doing mitzvot. By a human being, praying, doing good deeds, helping others, doing the mitzvot as they're written in the Torah as best he can. Every time we make a move that way, we pull up a spark. Because our desire attaches to the desire in creation. Now, this is a little bit more mystical for some people. But, you know, go out in your backyard and see a beautiful tree. What does that tree want? Well, King David said, All the trees of the forest will sing to God. Why? A tree sings to God? Really? If you had the right ears, you might hear it. 
But the basic idea is that the tree has desire for God because it is made from God. So you see, there's an energetic loop from the creator to creation back to creator. And the sparks are followed. That's their journey. That's their racetrack. And, and man steps into the system and promotes the system and elevates the system. And, and merits, uh, gives it power. So when you do a mitzvah or you just have longing for God, I mean, Ahmed says, very simple, go out to the forest and talk to God and the grasses in the fields, the trees, everything will help your prayer because they're doing the same thing you're doing. Understand? Because think of creation as just sparks of desire that want to return. And when we do our work, we're returning the spark in a very high form called prayer, as opposed to another form that a tree uses or an insect or a lion when it roars at the zoo. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been down to Africa lately. But they roar in the zoo once in a while, and the whole zoo jumps up. Why? Because the lion is expressing his desire. And desire is something we all connect to, whether whatever level of creation it's at. Next time a mosquito lands on your hand, you know, he wants to take some blood home. Well, just look at it for a minute and understand he wants to live too. Now, do we have to let him live off us? Uh, that's a personal question. But the point is that when Egypt was the Egypt of that day, it was the world power, the center of commerce, of business, of science, of spirituality, of paganism, of idol worship, if you will. The occult was alive and well in Egypt. So they had a lot of power there. And those sparks, God said, you know what? This human race has a problem. Everywhere I go, they're going against my will. I'm going to create the Jewish people. They're going to go down. They're going to serve me. They're going to lift up the sparks of Egypt and pull them back and send them, bring them back to Canaan. When Jacob and his brothers came down, the whole family were serving God, learning Torah, praying. So they're pulling out sparks all the time. This sounds too mystical. There was a man who went to the Mideast, excuse me, the Midwest it was, in America. And he was collecting money, a religious Jew, for a yeshiva back in Jerusalem. And he went to this little synagogue in the middle of nowhere, and he walked in to pray the afternoon prayer. It's about 15, 20 minutes usually. And he started to pray, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he, and he cried for like a half hour. And he couldn't believe it. It was like Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. And he felt like the holiest man on this side of the planet, right? And, and he went home to his Rebbe in Jerusalem, and he told him the story. He says, Rebbe, I come back to Jerusalem, the holiest city, and I don't pray like that. But I go out to the middle of the Midwest somewhere, I don't know, Nebraska, you know, <laughs> Omaha, right? And, and he prays like the, the, the greatest tzaddik of the generation. The Rebbe looks at him and says, does that surprise you? Here in our synagogue, everybody's praying with real intention and power. They're lifting the sparks all the time. Because there's sparks in food, there's sparks in drink, there's sparks in each day has its energy field. Each week, each month, each year. And when you went to that little synagogue, maybe the people weren't praying so intensively. And they weren't lifting all the sparks, so they were waiting for somebody to, who came who was. And they all jumped on you. It's like he jumped in the middle of a spiritual bonfire and lit him up because all those sparks were in that little synagogue waiting for him to show up. And so when he came back and he had this comparative experience, he didn't understand. But that little story can tell us a little bit about the idea of the Jewish people going down to Egypt to be redeemed. But their job, well, going there, well, why do they need to redeem sparks? Why does a human being have to leave his home and take on, you know, get on your donkey or your camel and head south? You know, it's not too far. If I look out my window, I, you can almost imagine you see a pyramid, but it's a little farther than the naked eye. But why do we have to do this? And why the Jewish people? Well, why the Jewish people is simple. Because 
all the nations refused the Torah when it was given its, before it was given at Sinai, all the nations. There were 70 archetype ancient nations. And God offered it to all of them. And they said, what's in it? And they said, oh, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Oh, no, but we do those things. We can't stop a society now. It's too hard. And the Jews said, not seven Ishma. They didn't ask what's in it. They said, well, if it's from you, we'll do it. And we'll figure it out afterwards. Now, that was the right answer. And they got the Torah. But they didn't know they were going to go into exile for, for 400 years in Egypt and pull up a lot of sparks and come out a nation with a lot of wealth and come back to Canaan. And then Yeshua, Joshua would take them in. The story continues. All the exiles of the Jews are the same story over and over. Rome, Greece, Spain, Britain, France, Russia, everywhere the Jews have gone, they've set up themselves up. They've started, they've built, they've grew, they created tremendous spiritual and financial power wherever they went. And then the sparks were lifted and it was time to go. And it's hard to leave when you're a successful businessman in the middle of Manhattan. Where am I going to go back and live in a little kibbutz in, in northern Israel? I got a, 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 an empire here in Manhattan. How do you leave? Well, what you leave is when you understand that the job is done. The sparks are lifted. And so that's where we are in history now. But yet there are still sparks out there, a few. And there were one of the places those sparks were is Aza, right over there. Because Aza, it used to be a Jewish city. In 600 AD, there was a synagogue from then. And some famous people have come from there as well. But it was all overrun. It was destroyed. It was emptied. And other people came from different places. It was no longer a part of Israel. Now, I was with Rav Yitzhak Kaduri, one of the great Kabbalists of the previous generation, when he said, Aza is not our territory. But what's happened is God has demanded us to go in there. This whole war was a setup to get us to go in there to remove the sparks of a holiness that were trapped there in the darkest place on earth, Aza, the place of terror tunnels, murder chambers. I don't want to even talk about it too much. I'm trying not to get too upset here. It's Saturday night, and I'm going to have a good week. <laughs> But reality is, it knocks on the door wherever it is, you are. Now, so we understand that we've on this, been on this 3,500-year journey of gathering the lights of God. And you say, why? Why does God give us that job? The chosen people. The chosen to be hated. The chosen to be run after. The chosen to be murdered, etc., etc. Who wants that job? Well, the Jews took it because they knew there was a promise at the end. That's the promise here the Zohar is telling us. That in the future, death will be swallowed. In the future, the redemption will be complete, whether we come in the front door or the back door. Whether we come by force or we come by will. Whether we come with glory or we come with our heads down, uh, shaking and cold and wet and tired and wounded. Jews are coming back from everywhere, because they recognize the cycle. Even if they don't know this piece of Zohar and they haven't learned these books, they know it in their soul. They're being called back because it's time, because the sparks have been redeemed. And why do we have to do this redemption? Because God is, he's, a, he's like a Hollywood producer. He has a new movie to show. You know, because for God, it's a six-day event. The whole creation is seven days. He's billions of years around, you know, he, that's it. He's got a lot more projects in this universe than just planet Earth. But man was special. And God wanted us. He tells us why he sent us to Egypt. In order that you tell your children, your children's children. Now, why does God need us to tell his story about how we got 10 plagues in that removed us from Egypt and God split the sea and brought us out? Why? To tell us how great he is because he's a master of all reality? Okay, that's uh, a possibility. It says, right, God built, built, made us for his glory. He formed us and shaped us for his glory. What? Why? Why does he need the glory? 
He's the humblest. He's the greatest. You don't need glory when you're the greatest. You don't have to show anybody anything. No, but he wanted us to go through it so we could tell the story for the sake of humanity's education, that humanity would learn about its own inherent greatness and the greatness of the Jewish people in their mission was for the sake of all of humanity to get a Ten Commandments, to get a piece of faith in truth that we're not alone. And so we had to go through the story to tell the story so people would hear the story and know the story. And then Charlton Heston could make a movie and would believe a tiny bit more, you know, and so on and so forth until all of humanity gets the idea that they're not alone and you can't just do what you want because there's a metaphysical laws that rule everything we do if we want to be part of the winning team. So the backdoor redemption is happening through places like Aza, through places like the Warsaw Ghetto, through places like the Inquisition, Rome, Athens, Babylon. But we're home. And more and more of us are coming home. And you have a chance to get on the train. <laughs> too late? I don't know about what too late means. It's never too late as long as you're breathing. And you can get yourself to your travel agent. You don't even need a tra travel agent. Just iPhone your ticket. And you're on a plane to Israel. But Balamavet Minetzach means, Lenetzach means, God is going to swallow death. And the whole human paradigm is going to change. And when that happens, big, big things are going to happen. And well, you know some of them. The revival of the dead. The building of the third temple. The messianic redemption in its fullness, its completion. Right now, we're just gathering up the, our tools to go home from the exile. So think about it clearly. Think about it. Does it make sense to you, the story I just told? Or does it sound like another fantasy from some far-off imagination? It's the truest thing I ever heard from all the religions that I've read about. You know, at a certain point, we believe in the movie because it makes more sense than the reality around us. And we're living the movie. So come here. Live it with us. Shavuot Tov.